Welcome to SSDD Studio. Our next seminar is a conversation between two different designers of different eras. Both have designed for IKEA at some point and they will discuss changes, evolution and learning in the design process. <laughs> Meet Nils Gamelgård and Akanshka Deo Sharma in Proximity for Design, Life at Home as a Starting Point for Everything, moderated by Raphael Batke. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here in Southern Swedish Design Days. Um, yeah, what are we talking about here today? Um, we are talking about uh, something which is very dear to IKEA, very dear to IKEA Museum. And we want to talk about life at home as a starting point for everything. Life at home is core essential to everything we are doing. And we are doing a lot for it. We have nearly one million home visits done in the last decades to actually understand what it means, how people live, what the frustrations are in order to produce great products which are fulfilling the needs and the many problems we have in our homes. Um, and it all starts with a vision which IKEA has. Um, you all know it, maybe. I know it quite good. It's all about to create a better everyday home for the many people. And it follows by a business idea and it's to offer a wide range of well-designed products um, which are functional and therefore really um, uh, creating a good price point that many people can afford them and actually they can have an impact for many people. And now you will ask yourself, how do we do that at IKEA at such a scale, being a global company and being responsible and being actually home furnishing so many homes? How do we do that? And uh, there's um, a secret uh, um, recipe behind it, and it's called the five dimensions of democratic design. Democratic design, as we define it, is five different uh, angles to judge each and every product. It is, of course, by the price. Everything starts with a price point when we start to develop a product. It is going further to the functionality, really looking into what are needs and um, how can we fulfill best function possible. Then, of course, it is going into a beautiful form language, which is really uh, lifting the product in the home environment. It is the quality, obviously, Everything needs to be super durable, safe for kids, safe for us in a home environment. And of course, it is sustainability. How can we produce something which actually lasts long, which actually is, has an end life cycle that we can reuse it in, in some way as well. So sustainability also is really important. If you want to know a little bit more about this, we have just opened um, a few weeks ago a fantastic exhibition at IKEA Museum only focusing on democratic design and how we are actually doing all this behind the scenes, how products are developed, that they can be flat packed, that they can be stackable, uh, that they have amazing uh, quality, that they really fulfill sustainability uh, uh, things we have. A little bit about myself. My name is Rafael Bartke. I will moderate this year together with my two wonderful colleagues, Nils and Akansha. And um, I have my background in interior design. I am um, uh, 41 years old. I have started uh, with 17 years with an apprenticeship at IKEA as interior designer. I've been over the years um, followed and established quite a lot of different IKEA stores. Uh, 26 IKEA stores I've been building up with the knowledge of the different places, really trying to fulfill the needs of uh, uh, um, inhabitant in Tokyo, for example, where we did uh, build uh, a, a store in um, Shin Misato. Um, and with that experience, I worked um, with many different companies. I have been um, for some years in the catalog production, really trying to fulfill all the needs uh, on a global perspective. And then thereafter, I worked with product development also within IKEA of Sweden. Since six years now, I'm working at the IKEA Museum, where we are telling the story of IKEA uh, in 
many different ways. Uh, we are showing lots of different old uh, products, uh, which you can also explore uh, when you come to Elmholt. But now, enough being said, I would like to welcome to stage Akansha and Niels. Welcome. Where do we stand? You can stand or sit. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yes. Can I sit? So, um, we see here in the background uh, Life at Home as a starting point for everything. Um, I already mentioned uh, we have done lots of different home visits, um, which are, of course, a core essential part for us to actually really um, uh, develop products which have a meaning. And this is also what we want to talk about here. The past and the future creates a proximity, pr proximity for design. And now uh, I would like to ask Akansha if you could uh, maybe say a few words about yourself. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Akanksha Dil Sharma, and uh, I am from Delhi, India. Uh, I am working as an in-house designer based in IKEA since five years. Uh, I also was an intern, like you, Rafael, uh, in 2016, and 2017 is when I started working for IKEA. But my background is I've studied fashion textiles uh, in Delhi, in one of the most reputed uh, fashion schools. And I've had the luxury and the, you know, uh, fortunate, uh, I've been fortunate to have worked a lot with the craft clusters and uh, different communities in India when it comes to different um, crafts and how to incorporate the knowledge that I was learning in the school uh, with my designs, working with the people. Um, and what more can I say? I think also I just moved here last year, mm -hmm. which was a big uh, shift for me. Um, it was, Delhi has 30 million, more than 30 million people. And now I am in a city which has 300,000. <laughs> so that's quite a big number crunch difference. And, uh, and yeah. So I'm excited to explore this place. Wonderful. Warm welcome, Akansha. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And a few words about you, Niels. Do you want to present yourself? Yes, of course. Please. Um, my name is Niels Gammelgaard. Um, I'm an uh, architect from the Royal Academy of uh, Art in Denmark. I was educated and finished as an industrial designer at 19... 70 and um, uh, five years later i am after i have built some houses and made something i met ingmar kamrad and uh, ingmar he changed my life totally because um, i was socialist at that time and uh, when i met ingmar he presented me for a world of a socialistic company in a capitalistic world so um, he wanted, I think it was so nice that he wanted to, to make cheap furniture, well-designed cheap furniture for the many people. And for that reason, he don't want to earn more money than the wheels could turn around. It was just so nice for me. And he asked me to, to work for him. And I said, yes. And... Um, I worked for 30 years with Ingmar, and uh, the first 10 years we were very close. Uh, he was living in Denmark, uh, or passing Denmark, and uh, I, was, um, I had a car together with him, an old Volvo car, so I called him and said, can I use it today for Elmo? No, you cannot, you had to take your own, and so on. <laughs> it was very fantastic, and he inspired me to a lot of products. Mm -hmm. for IKEA. Wonderful. Yeah. Really good. We will talk about the products in a short moment, about yeah. your products. Akansha, um, we will start with you and some of the products you have been creating in your career within IKEA. And uh, it is, of course, a big topic here to see how the world is changing. Uh, we have lots of sustainability issues which we really want to tackle and want to uh, advance, so to say, our production methods 
of course, in the scale as we have as IKEA. And uh, you have uh, done a fantastic collaboration, which is actually taking waste uh, material as a resource for a product. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, Rafael, of course. Uh, it's uh, this slide that I can see. Uh, you can see there are some pretty hard uh, images combined together. Um, and this is a, a site that you see in the northern parts of India. Um, I'm from Delhi, so I have seen, um, you could say I have seen in 15 years the sky change drastically. So what I know as a child when I was growing up, the skies were much different than now. We hardly see any stars there as you can see in this uh, picture as well in the middle. Mm. Um, and there is a big uh, issue of uh, poor air quality, as uh, some of you may have known. Um, and then at, at, at IKEA, we thought like, OK, how do we tackle this problem? Like, we have so many people working for us in IKEA, and like our suppliers and like our customers in many different ways. How can we be the change makers? And, you know, move one step forward towards creating a positive impact on mm. the society. So uh, we tried to tackle the rice straw, which you see on the third photo. Um, rice straw is one of the crops that's usually burned in the northern parts of India in the winter time, which uh, is a heavy contributor of air pollution. Um, and uh, we thought, OK, you know, maybe uh, like we like in India, we don't have the proper infrastructure or the policies to dispose the leftover rice straw. Mm -hmm. So why not we try to explore this as a new material, see what can become of it at mm -hmm. IKEA. And maybe we're not saying we're going to solve the entire problem, but we can maybe give an idea and like, you know, move one step forward. Mm -hmm. So we, um, our first pilot project, you could say, um, is for Andring, which means change in Swedish. I learned that. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a collection uh, made of home products. You can see some lampshades, some bowls, some uh, runners, and there are also some rugs and other um, storage items. Um, and I collaborated with uh, another designer who's from Finland, Ina Voiravirta. And we got the brief to explore this material. What can it become? We were free to like, you know, explore as many techniques as we could. Mm. And the main objective was to put this positive message that, hey, we are actually not looking, it as a, not looking at it as a waste material, but like how can we enable uh, using waste material as a new renewable resource for our IKEA products? Mm. Um, and it can be scalable mm. to different parts of the world where we have similar problems. So there was a lot of exploration that <coughs> went into it, and we made it in India mm. in 2019. <coughs> um, yeah, and then I can keep talking more and more, <laughs> but I will hold back. <laughs> Fantastic. It's this. super inspiring to see, of course, that we can actually, from a waste product, that we can produce something with it. So a really good thought, uh, which we should take further. But then we are also talking a little bit more about uh, different uh, crafts, for example, which are unfortunately less and less uh, replaced uh, due to the industrialization. Uh, we are more tech uh, oriented and so on. So craft is also a topic which you have been uh, uh, taking up uh, uh, in several collections, but uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the social entrepreneur um, projects you have been working with. Yes, um, I think I've been in a very um, cozy position to have been working for IKEA actually because I'm getting a lot of opportunities to be still working with like a lot of artisans. Mm. And my education, if you see uh, in my college, has been a lot about exploring the different crafts in India. So it's a really uh, dream situation Scenario. to be in IKEA, <laughs> to be able to still work with artisans for, from not just India, but like also uh, we have been working in Thailand and in Jordan. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it, it has been a really long uh, but also very insightful experience where we have uh, this initiative called the Social Entrepreneurship Initiative from where we make a lot of different kind of products 
uh, crafted products and also collections. And the main objective is to uh, empower different communities, uh, different um, vulnerable and marginalized groups of people coming from different parts of the world. Mm. So the idea is how can we make people, uh, these vulnerable communities, uh, financially independent mm. and provide a decent source of livelihood mm. for for them and to raise their families and for hopefully, you know, years and generations to come. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had the fun task to work a lot with people in India uh, and also the refugee women in Jordan. Mm. Um, and I've also uh, worked with some ceramicists in Doi Tung, Thailand. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this picture on the right uh, is, uh, you can see a collaboration between Thailand, Jordan and um, India. Like how can, we, how can we make a story and a collection by utilizing local materials, local skill sets and local artisans mm -hmm. with local designers. Fantastic. You know, that when, when you do something like that, even on a large scale, yeah. then you're boosting the local economy. Mm. So this collection was kind of um, on a smaller scale to show that how can we, um, you know, collaborate more mm. and find the similarities mm. in our differences. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that is one of them. Fantastic. And, and we have a second... Um, social entrepreneur, which is um, more in Northern Thailand, I think here. Um, can you yes. tell us more about that? Yeah, I think I already just like covered everything, <laughs> but, uh, but I can yeah. uh, mention that it's um, when you're working with the social entrepreneurs, I think um, it's a very humbling experience. And you as a designer have a lot of responsibility around how should your designs be? Because you have to be really aware of the capabilities and capacities of the other people like who are making your products. So you have to really, as a human, understand what are they good at yeah. or what are they enjoying? How, what do they enjoy making? Is it something that they particularly like making? Could mm -hmm. I integrate what they want in my designs? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very equal collaboration in these projects. And, and for me, I think... Uh, it's also a very intimate one, at mm. least for when I talk about the um, women in India, uh, in Rajasthan and in Bikaner, I speak the language. Mm -hmm. So there is a level of like almost family and you, you understand each other. Yeah. So uh, I think that is something that I want to mention and also mm. just um, that we want to be able to provide um, good products like which has added value mm. in these collections mm. and projects, but at an affordable price. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, that is something we're trying to do to make it accessible to the many, that crafted products should not just go in the hands of some people, but mm -hmm. you know how many can afford it. Mm. And with that comes a lot of technical developments mm. and like uh, even one line of embroidery costs more. Mm. So you have to be really smart and really yeah. aware of like where does that embroidery go? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's a lot more that I can <laughs> also say. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. It's fantastic to see that actual production in this scale, in this uh, volume, is possible with Craftsman. So it's a, a really an inspiration. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much for this part here right now. Then I go over here to Niels. Niels, this is your chance to present some of your... Design classics, I would almost say. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, when I thought about this, I, um, I thought that the best way to cherish our planet is to design products in durable materials. Um, and with a design that appeals to next generation of users. So people will use the products again and again in generations to come. We don't have to produce new products. The chairs we made in the 70s is going over to next generation. I, I mean, that's fantastic. And that I have uh, experienced with when I made this, um, what shall I say, review of what I have done. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, the designer's responsibility is huge.
mm. and uh, the greater industrial production, the greater the responsibility. So, um, um, so it, you had to be a very, very skilled designer, and you must do the things um, so they will last for years. Uh, the design ideas inside. So, because if mis mistakes are made. Here, the customer do not don't buy the product, and the factory must fire people and close. Hmm. So the responsibility is big on every level. If the designer makes his job, he will help saving the world. It's uh, <laughs> in short. So, and I have experienced that these years that the products I do for IKEA in the 70s and the 80s are attracting young people now again as they did it 40 years ago. So that's the definition of a classic. Mm. And, um, and we used material when I was designing as steel, glass and polypropylene uh, were, and they are still suitable for rational industrial production. Mm. Um, and I can show it here. Tell us a little bit more about Folke. Yeah, this was my first year for I IKEA. I didn't know anything about furniture because I was an industrial designer, an architect. I wanted to change the world with good design for uh, everything else than furniture. But uh, Ingvar, he told me, you must do furniture. And then I, I, um, I've always be, been interested in the sitting man, the sitting position of the man. And uh, I was very fascinating about a professor in Denmark called Snorsen, and he was examining uh, the ankles of the chairs, mm -hmm. where should the pivot point be, and how should the ankles be. And then, of course, I made it so it's changeable. Okay, mm -hmm. it's. Um, I didn't know anything about furniture, but I think it was a very good idea. <laughs> and uh, I also think that because Snorsen said. If you want to sit without a back, mm. you can mm. sit like this. It's 135 degrees here, then your spine will have a natural form and you can sit at a 90 centimeter high table. Fantastic. And, um, <coughs> and this gives the possibility of hanging it on the table. Mm -hmm. So you have so created... This year, yeah, yeah. You have created a chair which has very many different functionalities. Exactly. Is it stackable? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's no art to make a non-stackable chair. Uh -huh. It's no art. Okay. But um, what was more fantastic is that I was educated as an industrial designer. And I came to this company and we went, I went with the people who were buying for IKEA to a factory and they placed an order of 125,000 chairs. I was <laughs> totally shocked <laughs> and so proud. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words about the other chairs we see here or should we? Yeah, then yeah. We, we of course continued with, um, with more chairs. Ingmar asked me to do a lot of things and, uh, and he said, Can, couldn't you, Nils, Jävla Nils, he said, okay, couldn't you, couldn't you make an uh, easy chair without textile, without foam, without all this. And then I, I, I made this one, which is a mathematical um, formula that called an hyperbolic in the hyperbolic parabolic. And it is used in architecture and used in everything. But it's very good for industrial production. And when you cut them together in a nice form, then you sit perfect. <laughs> And um, uh, this is um, a stacking, uh, no, it's a collapsible chair which has a unique form. Mm. I mean, none of these are copies of anything. It's just unique designs. And um, now, 45 years later, uh, I can see that next generation loves it and uh, wants it. It's fantastic. This cheap IKEA company making classics. We never, ever thought about that. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, we have a few other classics uh, which you can see here. For example, Ted. Ted yeah. was a part of a quite big series. 
yeah, what, that's uh, what can you tell us about that, about TED, the folding chair? Yeah, TED is not an original chair. It's, it's a folding chair like many others. Uh, Kia had many in their sortiment. But uh, what, what we did here was we came to a big Italian company and what I did there was to curve the back double as much as all the other guys making folding chairs. And then they said, then you can pack them. But I took one and then I turned the other around and then it packs just exactly 40 millimeter per chair. Mm -hmm. And that makes all the difference in sitting because now it's just a very nice uh, sitting position. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, uh, we were cheapest on the market and uh, especially the German market was huge. And uh, we made during the time 22 millions of these chairs spread all over uh, IKEA world. <laughs> and they are still the best um, folding chair on the market. Lovely. <laughs> and now it's on the lapis market, okay? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One last uh, product which I would like to know a little bit more because there is a really good story in the background. You had a visit in a factory in Finland during the 80s, yeah. which is a supplier for our shopping trolleys. Yeah. So what right. happened there? Yeah, we saw how industrialized the production of the shopping trolleys was. So they were buying steel cheaper than other guys in big rolls and so on. And they could um, uh, operate it um, uh, very industrial. So I just, yeah, I just followed uh, the lead from other of my products at that time, the moment sofa and the guide shelf, mm -hmm. they were in the same uh, um, pr production mood, so uh, so it was not so difficult to make a table with the same construction, just 70 centimeter high and mm -hmm. so on. So, and uh, it turned out to be a very very nice product. Mm -hmm. I want the sofa. Eyes on that. The moment sofa is a very very dear product which you can hardly find on the Lopez. <laughs> no, it's yeah. difficult. It's I had to go to Bukowski now. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and we never thought about that at that time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I thought uh, to talk with you a little bit more about um, the topic of the day and how life at home actually is different in so many parts of the world. And uh, of course, you, Akansha, being from India, I would be a little bit curious in, in like the big needs and the, the frustrations in life at home and how you think that you can contribute to the understanding in a global scale, but also a little bit on yeah, what, what it means for you as a designer um, coming yeah. from India. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of uh, cultural differences. Uh, when you, at least for me now living in Sweden, I notice the cultural differences that there are. Uh, when you look at Sweden and India. But um, I think one of the most important thing that I would mention how we are so, um, how we're different is we have a lot of multi-generational families mm -hmm. still living together. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there are of course a lot of nuclear families now. Um, however, I was reading the latest Life at Home report and the statistics and uh, you can say that after the pandemic, there are a lot of people going back to their parents. Interesting. Um, I don't know about the global, but uh, mm -hmm. at least in India, that shift is happening a little bit more, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting because I think there is a level of sense of togetherness and support, mm -hmm. rising uh, housing prices, mm -hmm. um, the option to take care of your children, uh, and then to take care of your elders. Mm -hmm. I think those are the three factors which kind of promote multi-generational living mm -hmm. and it's really beneficial to the family. Mm -hmm. So I think that changes the dynamics of how you use the space in a home. Mm -hmm. What is life at home and like is a bedroom also then used as a study room? So I think the layout and planning also changes accordingly. And, uh, what um, does that mean then for privacy, for example? Yeah, like I think uh, privacy is one of the 
really big things that we don't have. Like, I don't think we have that concept called privacy. I grew up with my parents and like, the moment I closed my bedroom door, they thought I was hiding something. So it's, it's like a little bit like, it's not a concept, it's like, so, and, and, I, and I think we all know, we did a very extensive privacy life at home report, mm. how privacy is actually beneficial to our mental health and well-being. Mm. Uh, so privacy is not just to be yourself in your sacred place, but it's also to form relationships between mm. each other. Mm. You need privacy sometimes. And then, um, and then also you need privacy to find this sanctuary from the world. Mm. So there are many reasons why privacy is one of the biggest uh, factors for our mental health and well-being. And <laughs> we don't really have it in India. <laughs> like, so we, we try to find, and also because we have multi-generational living. So, you know, there's so many people in a smaller space. Then how do you share the bedrooms or like the dining spaces? It's all, um, yeah, we can, I think, learn a lot from those mm. homes and practices. And I read the statistics as well. 45% of Indians go outside their homes to find privacy, which I think is so interesting because then outdoor comes into play. Mm. How outdoor, like being outdoors or your relationship with outdoor is not just to, uh, it's not just to uh, form your relationship with nature, mm. but it is also to find privacy, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know. The inner calmness. Yeah, Possibly. which is like a revelation. So I think <laughs> that is also very interesting. And then another quick thing that I can say is customization. Mm -hmm. We love customization of furniture. Mm -hmm. We love solid wood in India mm -hmm. and we love to customize. Every household is probably having some couch or daybed or a chair or chairs or a table customized. Mm -hmm. And that's the local market that we support. Mm -hmm. So I think that is super interesting, sustainable, mm -hmm. and uh, something that uh, we can also learn mm -hmm. from India. Yeah. So it's fantastic to see what, what we can actually uh, learn from other countries with doing home visits, with doing all the research, putting the effort in, trying to understand people's needs in a home environment and actually really then uh, solving problems with a final product. So it's amazing. I can myself uh, quickly talk a little bit about, I've been um, working in many different countries, uh, also um, mainly focusing on kitchens and it is a totally different environment, how people cook in Europe versus in Japan, in India, in China. Um, so there is a, a lot of uh, flexibility in the core range we are actually offering, which still gives the possibility for adaptation, customization, which is a, a fantastic uh, virtue uh, we have developed because in the end we have a big assortment of about 9,000 products, but they are actually globally provided. So it is all about the details and the, how we can implement that uh, uh, to solve the needs of the many people. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, then I thought um, to talk a little bit um, about the task of being actually a designer. And uh, Niels, you are maybe a little bit more the designer who has been a lot on the factory floor. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, back in the 70s, in the 80s? How was that to work for IKEA <laughs> as a designer? Yeah, but, um, you, you know, I was traveling with the buyers and uh, the buyers were negotiating in the, in the, in the meeting room about prices, about leverances and uh, so on. And I was strolling around in the factory and uh, looking at the processes Ingmar told me, go down, don't be in the offices, go down and see what they can do. <laughs> and then you find these people which are the people who can help you. Make good friends with them, uh, then everything is possible. And uh, it's completely right. It's, it's not the um, directors that are running the company, it's the people on the floor. So uh, I went down and get good friends with them. And because IKEA was such a, a huge buyer for them, the, I, I was welcoming, I was welcome all over. 
and uh, I could go down and uh, make a sketch uh, in the model shop and they will immediately make the model. Hmm. Uh, so um, that's the way you had to work with, mm -hmm. with the factories and you, it's the same today, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's listen a little bit to Akansha maybe. <laughs> what do you think is your role as a designer today? You're a different generation. What's, what does it take uh, for you? Yeah, I, I agree with Nils. That's mm. how it's done. You have to get your hands dirty mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. go down and like uh, you can't sit somewhere else further from where the creation is happening. Mm. So I think in like uh, work processes and like how we work, way of working is pretty similar like yeah. now. I think the pandemic may have changed that a few, uh, like a little bit, um, in terms of what you can access, um, which is o which also makes sense because we, I guess, shouldn't be taking that many flights um, and traveling from one continent to the other all the time. So I think, uh, but other than that, I think as a the resp like yeah, who is a designer today is a very big question and. I kind of wake up with this daunting like question every morning like okay what am I doing or like what should I be doing how should I be doing it better so mm. I think the question is more like um, who is a designer today like and I feel that the definition of a designer and what is design is being redefined as we speak mm -hmm. because of the situation uh, that we are in as mm. a society mm -hmm. with the accelerating climate change and um, ever increasing um, inequalities um, between different people. Mm. Uh, I think um, we have a very bigger, like even greater responsibility to really think why we are making things, yeah. what is the purpose, um, and if we are making things, are we really making it better? Um, are we empowering communities? Are we getting closer to, um, yeah, um, regenerating communities and practices mm. while uh, taking care of the planet? Mm. So within the means of the planet and also how can we empower people while almost healing the planet, mm. because that's what we need right now. Yep. And I think that is kind of those big questions are redefining what role do we have as designers mm. in the future? Yeah. I don't have the answers, but no. I'm still figuring it out. It's a big assignment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think so. Absolutely. One uh, thing which, of course, I have to ask you both is uh, the, the question of inspiration. It is a big question, which is always <laughs> out there. But um, what do you think about inspiration? Where does it come from? How do you get it? I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> I do you hate that do question. <laughs> Niels, okay, Niels, do you want to? I have uh, a professional uh, uh, answer for it. Answer for it. I love the touch of the machine because I'm an industrial the designer. The touch of the machine. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so you like the production as such. Exactly. Yes. Wonderful. I'm an industrial designer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Akanska? <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I think. I think the sounds of machines are quite nice as well. <laughs> uh, but um, it's there's no like one epiphany every time that when we design. But I think just the fact that. I'm just in general very curious mm. and it really inspires me to see the different uh, practices and living scenarios of people. Mm -hmm. Like so home visits uh, has been a really good uh, exercise for me in uh, working in IKEA. But also whenever I do have the opportunity to travel, I think that in itself is very inspiring because it kind of pushes you to get out of your zone of what you know in your bubble mm -hmm. and to really see the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me is quite inspiring um, on a yeah, yeah. regular scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, s then uh, we could ask a little bit more about what, how do you see the future? Is there something more you're kind of dreaming of? 
means for you? It's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a better task. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> now you just Some put everything on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I explained it a little mm, bit before yeah, yeah, when yeah, I was yeah, talking. Yeah. Your dreams. Uh, yeah. But I think, I think you said future of design. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Um, I would like to quote one of my dear colleagues mm -hmm. who I think uh, has put it down so brilliantly, Nanette Vistel. Mm -hmm. She has said, um, we need to stop, we need to stop uh, making products or designing products, but rather design systems. Mm -hmm. We should change our thinking uh, from designing products to designing systems. So it's a very big systematic change mm. that I think will be and is going to be the future of design. Mm. So of course, we will still make a chair. We will still need a table. We will still need a bed to sleep on. Mm. But um, it's really more important how we are making it and who's making it and the fair practices around it. Mm -hmm. But but I think what we should be aiming at is how can we change the system for mm. the better if mm -hmm. by making this one chair or by making this one table. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a, that stuck on to me yeah. and I would like to leave people with that. Mm -hmm. How can we design for systematic change mm -hmm. rather than looking at it as individual products? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. And there maybe IKEA due to the scale has a really good opportunity to make that change Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think LED uh, is mm -hmm. a great example of yes. what we have done by just <coughs> simply tweaking something yeah. so small yeah and uh, also replacing alkaline batteries mm -hmm. in 2019 mm. by just eliminating something yeah. we create a systematic better change mm. for for us as a planet but also yeah. um, the society around yeah yeah wonderful super good with that being said i would like to thank you very much for joining online and here in stage if you're curious about the history of IKEA or the future, you're more than welcome to visit IKEA Museum in Elmholt. But of course, also, if you're out there in the world, we have a digital museum which you can explore 24 hours. You can just scan this code here and explore the history and the future of IKEA. Thank you so much, Akansha and Niels. And I you have, have one last word. I have a yes. question. <laughs> Two news, because <laughs> okay. I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> I need to ask you, because I'm wondering about it. Um, you have uh, had many years of experience and life, knowledge, uh, and it may sound a cliche question, but it is important. What is that one advice you will give to the younger generation <laughs> and the designers out there? Could be anywhere in the world. Um. You must be very, very good, and you must be very, very honest with your design. And mm. don't do anything that you uh, regret. Mm. I mean, uh, if you make three chairs, it doesn't matter. If you made hundreds, it matters a little more. But if you made millions, you had to be very, very skilled. Mm. Yeah, so so big knowledge. Hone your craft. Yeah. I think yeah. that's what I take away. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so nice. much. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>